Thank you very much for the um, very kind introduction and the um, organizing committee for um, bringing me here to Edinburgh, which is, I realized, a really beautiful town. So I, let's see, is this the right one? No. I could not be better placed um, after following Ian Bilmut and, and, and Shinya Wanaka because this is my typical introduction slide uh, of my talk. So um, this was exactly you know, the, the, the transformative findings of uh, Ian uh, with the nuclear transfer experiment, which showed for the first time that you can actually reprogram an adult mammalian cell into totipotency. And Shinya uh, went on to, to show how easy it is to reprogram the cell. Um, I was wondering whether we can actually extend uh, or, or conceptualize these, these findings. And we are thinking of... Um, uh, two, two possibilities. Historically, differentiation has been associated with the accumulation of what we call epigenetic marks, sort of chromatin features, DNA methylation, and so forth, which uh, gradually restrict the um, expression of gene patterns and thereby also restrict the developmental potential of these cells when, when the cells go on the differentiation. I've tried to symbolize this with these, with these bars that are accumulating in, in the genome. It's, we, you would start with some sort of tabula rasa situation in the, uh, in the early embryo. And uh, the uh, reprogram to pluripotency or totipotency would be nothing else than uh, taking away these accumulated differentiation associated accumulated epigenetic marks and per default you end up in this pluripotent state. However, another possibility could be true, which is that uh, pluripotency is not an empty uh, epigenetic state, so to say. It's a highly specific but unique um, epigenetic state, and that needs to be actively induced. And perhaps that is what, what the uh, famous Yamanaka factors are doing. They try to establish this embryonic stem cell typical uh, chromatin state. So if that latter model is true, then it actually should be possible to take different uh, factors and push the cells into a, another unique uh, epigenetic state. And that's exactly what we wanted to uh, test. And I should uh, mention that um, there was, when we, when we started this, uh, when, when I started my own lab about eight years ago, there was already quite a lot of evidence um, that you can actually push uh, uh, somatic cells into each other. And uh, the, the famous MyOD experiment was mentioned already uh, before. Um, but, uh, and, and I've listed a couple other examples that were known at the time in 2009. Uh, but uh, when you look at all these examples, um, there's al always one common theme, which is that these inter-somatic cell conversions were only possible between very closely related cell types. And actually, it was, uh, uh, people have tried a lot to push the cells further, and they were unsuccessful. So it was sort of believed in the field that there is a, a, you know, um, a boundary, that you, you can't re really push the cells all the way to, to, uh, to, uh, to other cells. For example, MyOD was not able to uh, uh, reprogram um, ectoderm-derived cells to, into muscle cells. <coughs> so after this, um, really after Shinya's work, I sort of wanted to challenge this, this idea. And we specifically asked whether we can convert um, skin-derived fibroblasts uh, directly in, into neurons and whether this would be possible. In an approach very similar that, that, that Shinya um, uh, used, we thought of um, uh, um, about 20 or so candidate factors that, if possible, would perhaps be able to mediate this, this conversion. We cloned them all together, we um, mixed them, and uh, as a pool, uh, trans transferred them into, uh, into fibroblasts, into mouse embryonic fibroblasts, and, and looked for the reactivation of neuronal markers. And um, Unlike control conditions, where you always see a couple fibroblasts actually expressing neural markers, and I always like, I think it's really important to show because many people have been very excited about finding neural markers in fibroblasts, but you know, that doesn't necessarily mean those are actually neurons. However, in these 19 factor conditions, um, in very rare cases, though, I must uh, importantly point out, um, we not only have induced neuronal markers, but also have changed their morphology dramatically. And it doesn't take much of a, I think, a neuroscience uh, training, uh, you don't need much of a neuroscience training to appreciate that those cells really resemble neurons, and we perhaps actually have accomplished our, our goal to convert fibroblasts to neurons. So from, um, as, I, as I pointed out, these, uh, uh, these cells were very rare in the dish, so it was um, very, very inefficient. And, uh, 
you can imagine it was a, it was a very complicated uh, and very um, uh, you know, um, sort of messy experiment with, with these 19 factors that, that we used. And it took, it took a little while until we found out um, what the, the key factors wa was. And, and the reason why it took a while is because we never thought that single factors would be able to do anything. As I just pointed out, they have been tried already uh, since uh, you know, one or two decades before. But uh, we saw that this one factor, which is called AECL1, which, also, which is also a BHLH factor, actually is able to do something. It's not quite uh, the same picture that I just showed you with the 19 factors, but AECL1 alone is able to induce these sort of immature looking neuronal cells. So then we thought, well, this is great. Perhaps AECL1 is not sufficient, but, um, but is, is you know, doing a portion of the reprogramming. And how about we combine AECL1 with the other factors in two factor combinations and ask whether other factors would support this is one only effect. And sure enough, there were a couple other CNAs, brain factors, MIT1, like OLIC2, SIG1, that, uh, that enhanced this, uh, this, this effect, and we combined these all together. And for, from, from then on, it was fairly easy to, to wiggle down the critical number, and we ended up with these three factors, AEC1, BRAIN2, and mid one like which were the smallest combination, uh, smallest number of, of, of CNAs that were uh, the most efficient to convert these, these cells into these neuro, into, into neural looking cells. And now, as you can see, the efficiency were much higher. They're about 20% of the starting population. And we had way, now way more cells to characterize. And we showed that these cells express you know, essentially all uh, uh, pan-neuronal markers that we are uh, aware of. And most importantly, as a uh, uh, talented postdoc in, in Tom, uh, Tom, Tom Sudov's lab, Xi Ping Pang, uh, um, uh, demonstrated uh, these cells um, had uh, the two principal <laughs> functional properties of neurons. Namely, they were able to fire action potentials and um, uh, form synaptic context, uh, uh, contacts uh, with, with each other. So that was, of course, very, very exciting. We sh showed, and I hope I could convince you, that it is actually possible to convert fibroblasts into neurons. But ever since this, this first uh, uh, discovery, we were really um, uh, investigating and really curious how these uh, transcription factors are actually able to, to accomplish this, this task. And we, we have uh, initially worked a lot about uh, AS1, and we have found out um, that is actually also a pioneer factor, as, as Abdinur just showed you, very similar to some of the, uh, the Yamanaka factors. And that explains, uh, in part, why you know, this factor can uh, act alone and induce these morphologic changes already uh, alone. But more recently, we have um, focused on uh, another factor called MIT1-like, which is uh, much less uh, studied. Uh, than, than ASL1 was. When we, when we found it as a reprogram factor, there were only four entries into the um, PubMed database about it. So it is a, a family member um, of three genes. Uh, the name giving gene is called MIT1, or myelin transcription factor 1, because it was cloned in a, a CDNA uh, library in, in oligodendrocyte precursor cells. Um, and it is a zinc finger containing protein. It's a fairly uh, uh, large, uh, for, for a transcription factor, it has uh, three uh, clusters of zinc fingers illustrated in, in, in orange here, the middle one and in a two, two distal side. And then there is this name giving MIT1 domain, which is a uh, sequence uh, conserved between these three family members. And the, the only other thing that was known about MIT1 like was its beautiful expression pattern. It turns out it is a very specific Oh, it's, it's a transcription factor very specifically in, in neurons, for one. And uh, second, it's not only specific, but it appears to be expressed in virtually all neurons, uh, both peripheral and central nervous system. So it's tightly linked with uh, the neuronal identity. And I'm actually not aware of any other transcription factor that fulfills both of these criteria. So it's, uh, it's a very interesting uh, factor, it seemed like. So the first thing we did is, uh, we took the, uh, this, this gene apart. We took this protein apart. As I said, it's a fairly complex uh, 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 protein with you know, putative many uh, uh, domains. And um, we made several uh, you know, mutations and truncation mutations to ask you know, what domains are critical for, for the reprogramming uh, to occur. And ch to, just to cut to the, to the chase, it turned out that this little fragment, about a third of the size of the full-length protein, is able to uh, reprogram the cells with, with you know, 100% efficiencies of the, of the, of the full-length protein. So all the reprogramming function, at least, 
um, um, must be sort of encoded in this in this smaller fragment. So it contains the two zinc fingers, which are uh, uh, pr presumably a DNA binding domain, and this uh, previously uncharacterized sort of um, sequence, uh, uh, no homologinal um, protein domain here. When you don't, uh, then further restrict this uh, uncharacterized domain, then gradually the reprogram efficiency goes down, and when you mutate the uh, DNA binding domain, again, the reprogram efficiency is abolished. So it's sort of reassuring. You actually do need uh, um, you know, DNA binding function for this factor to work. <coughs> when you then put back, um, or when you fuse this other DNA binding domain here, which, was pre which is not present in the smallest uh, fragment, then we, we fully restore the reprogram function again. So that argues that these two, uh, at least these two, uh, I should point out uh, up here, these two domains here uh, are functionally redundant. Um, initially, we had thought this might be a very complicated, uh, and complex acting transcription factor, potentially interacting with different DNA um, uh, motifs, potentially recruiting different areas together, maybe inducing looping and, and all these kind of things. But it sort of looked like uh, they might uh, bind the same, the sa actually, actually the same uh, motif. So to test this, we, um, we collaborate with UC Taipalin in Finland, and uh, he actually produced small fragments of MID1, like containing either this or this other uh, DNA uh, binding domain. And in, indeed, uh, with, with the uh, in vitro um, Selex assay, he found that it's actually the exact same motif, this AAGTT, AAGTT motif, uh, that, is, uh, that com comes down with, with those these, uh, interaction domains. So the next thing we did is we asked, where is mid one leg actually binding in the, in the genome? So Abdinur told you already about this experiment called ChIP-seq, which uh, chromatin IP followed by sequencing, which is a way to um, to measure where a transcription factor is bound in the, in the genome. To that end, we um, developed our own antibodies. And because it was so specifically expressed in neurons, we were actually able to interrogate the um, binding pattern in neurons by taking uh, you know, entire fetal uh, brains. And that's what it did, because that's, that's where mid one is obviously expressed as the neurons are born. And so we get down. Here, a list of a couple thousand uh, significant uh, sites in the genome. And this is just a sort of a heat map that shows you the intensity or, or, or all the significant low site that is bound um, centered on the, on, on the peak and, and, uh, and the surrounding region. And the uh, intensity of the color shows you the number of reads, so the sort of intensity of binding, if you want. What was very reassuring that um, many of these sites contained, again, this AEGTT motif that, that we had uh, seen in the in vitro assay already, so reassuring that this data set is actually a, a good and valid data set. Somewhat surprising was the uh, finding that about half or so of these sites were very, very close to promoter regions. Usually transcription factors uh, interact with not only promoters, but primarily with enhancer regions, which are distal uh, 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 DNA elements, um, oftentimes many uh, can be away from the actual promoter. And it's oftentimes very difficult to actually associate the binding of a transcription factor with its uh, downstream target gene, like what genes are actually regulated by this, by this binding. So that was very different from mid one like in 42% you know, of the binding sites, we. You know, we, we could immediately tell what, you know, what is the transcription factor, or what is the, what is the downstream target gene, because it was literally sitting within the KB of the transcription start site. And then, of course, we asked, um, how does this uh, binding pattern in the physiological context, so to say, uh, compare with where mid one leg is bound uh, in fibroblasts, at, at 48 hours, it is the exact same time point that Abdenur told you um, about where uh, OCT4 and, and the other Yamanaka factors are sitting in fibroblasts. And the great surprise was that this binding pattern was very, very similar. And even if you take out the other two reprogramming factors, AS1 and BRAIN2, and only infect fibroblasts with mid one leg alone, again, we get a very similar binding pattern. We had seen the same thing for ASA1 uh, before, which I told you was this pioneer factor. So we, uh, we thought, well, this is a deja vu um, 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 uh, experience here. Uh, perhaps this is also a pioneer factor, can open up a closed chromatin and activate neuronal programs, and that's you know, uh, how it works. 
So to, to get at this question, we asked, well, how actually do these sites look like in fibroblasts before any transcription factors are infected, before mid one leg is there? What's the chromatin state uh, of these sites? And this is this data set up here. This is an MNAs data set, which is uh, uh, essentially uh, uh, interrogating the nucleosomal um, or the DNA which is closely associated with nucleosomes, so closed chromatin. And uh, first we uh, looked at our AC1 targets in, in red here, and as expected, there is a huge enrichment of these sites which we had shown before, that AC1 is actually primarily binding closed chromatin, and therefore we interpreted this as it must be a pioneer factor. But when you look at the blue signal, which is the mid one leg, which are the mid one leg targets in fibroblasts, in uninfected fibroblasts, we see a clear depletion of the signal. So totally surprising. The exact opposite of AC1, all, well, I'm not sure, most of these sites seem to be open and accessible for looks like any transcription factor. So there's nothing special about mid one leg actually that it can bind uh, all these targets. But then we started to wonder, you know, this is a very specific uh, transcription factor is specific for neurons, and it binds the same pattern in fibroblasts as it does in neurons. And all these sites are open in fibroblasts. So why should they be open in fibroblasts? You know, uh, this is a neural factor. It doesn't make too much sense. Well, the first hint we got at this sort of conundrum was when we started to look at what the transcriptional response is. Uh, of, of mid one leg. So we did RNA sequencing, which is a way to interrogate a genome-wide expression pattern. And we noticed, so in, in the green color uh, are the genes shown that are down-regulated, in red, the ones which are up-regulated. And um, in particular, in, early, in the early time points, we saw that most of these mid one leg uh, targets were uh, preferentially repressed. And also this is true when we plot uh, uh, the average of the mid one leg targets, there was a clear uh, significant trend that uh, the, the, the average uh, um, effect was repression. So it really challenged my postdoc a lot because uh, you know, reprogramming a fibroblast to a neuron is a very active process. I, 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 it was very difficult for me to believe that just a, you know, a repression of programs could be sufficient to, to um, you know, induce such dramatic morphological and cell biological changes. Of course, you can always argue you repress a repressor, but that still seems way too passive for me because it's more like, you know, there's a difference between de-repression and active induction. So I really challenged my postdoc more at Small, who did all this experiment, and uh, I said, you really have to come up with a functional experiment. And what he did is, because we knew so much about uh, you know, the, the protein and protein function, we knew that you know, this is a, the critical DNA binding domain, and this tiny fragment here is not uh, working anymore in the reprogramming assay. So we took this little fragment here and fused either a uh, transcription repressor, the ingredient repressor, or a transcription activator, VP64, to this DNA binding domain and again performed this reprogramming assay. And as you can see here, um, this is the level of reprogramming um, measured with two ways, with uh, measuring THG1 or tau, each of the um, um, It was set to 100% for AC1 plus mid one leg, uh, full length. And this here is the activity of AC1 alone, this non-functional fragment. And when we now use the repressor, we see, at least in one uh, essay, almost full restoration. In the, in the other essay, a partial um, sort of uh, um, function of, the, of this repressor. But when you use the activating form, we completely kill the system. It's even worse than, than ASA1, so it, it completely blocks reprogramming. So it's, repression is not uh, you know, uh, the, the, the whole story, but it's very clear that transcriptive repression is the clearly de uh, dominant function of, of mid one leg. So, you know, at this point I had to be convinced. Uh, this is what the data said. And when we actually think about it, it actually does make a lot of sense. Because when you reprogram a cell, two things have to happen. Not only do you have to induce the target program, in our case, a neuronal program, of course, somebody also has to repress the donor cell identity, in our case, the fibroblast transcriptional network. And we thought, well, maybe that's what uh, mid one leg is doing. Maybe uh, AC1 is inducing the neur neuronal program, being a pioneer factor, you know, going into its sites and activates the program. Whereas mid one leg 
binds the fibroblast uh, sort of uh, program and, and represses it. So we, um, we overlaid and, and did this uh, gene set enrichment analysis uh, using a fibroblast signature gene list with the mid one leg targets and there was a high degree of uh, significance uh, in, in, in this overlap, a huge enrichment uh, uh, among, these, among these lists. So that's, the hypothesis seemed to be true. That then we asked, again, thinking of you know, brain development and that mid one leg is expressed in neurons, you know, why should it be that there is a transcription factor that is specifically made in the brain to suppress a fibroblast program? doesn't make too much sense, those literatures are completely unrelated. Perhaps it is more likely that mid one leg also represses more programs. So we started to look at these uh, mid one leg targets a little bit more closer, and we, we saw that two uh, developmentally important and famous pathways, uh, the so-called notch pathway and the wind pathway, are heavily targeted and repressed during reprogramming. That actually makes a lot of sense. Uh, when mid one leg is induced, as the neuroprecursor cells are differentiating into neurons, those are exactly the, the two, two pathways that keep neuroprecursor cells um, from differentiating. So it makes a lot of sense that there's a transcriptional regulator that represses those, those two pathways. But then we also found some, or you know, saw some, some other genes that are either associated with proliferation or, or other specific lineages that are either repressed during your programming or stay uh, off during, during your programming. And you see some, some, some examples there. When we do GO term analysis, which, which are these lists associated with, with, with specific you know, cell biological functions, from the mid one like target lists, we do see, and I've highlighted a couple uh, of those, actually a lot of um, non-neuronal terms, uh, something like cartilage, heart, lung, and, and my postdoc particularly like this here, negative regulation of neuron differentiation, which, which is exactly to our point. Right, this is exactly what we think uh, uh, mid one leg might be doing. But this is still all descriptive and, and correlative. Uh, again, we uh, were thinking of how can we sort of uh, come up with a functional uh, test to, to, to show that mid one leg is actually repressing uh, another cell identity. And we thought maybe uh, given that myOD is such a strong inducer of the, of the muscle program, what about we, we combine mid one leg with myOD? and see whether mid one leg is able to suppress uh, this reprogramming, the, uh, suppress the induction of, of a muscle program. And the result was actually very clear. Uh, this here shows you a desmin staining uh, um, of fibroblasts infected with myOD just a couple days after infection. And when we add mid one leg to, to myOD, then there's way fewer cells that are uh, desmin positive in these cells. So it, it looks like a very strong repressor, functional repressor, at least of this, of this muscle program. So we have a couple more um, of, of um, evidence that support this, this notion now that, that mid one leg is a, is a very uh, sort of unique repressor if you want. It's exactly uh, the opposite function of the famous repressor REST, which uh, is a repressor known to specifically repress neuronal genes, but in many non-neuronal tissues and cell types. Here we have the exact opposite. We have a transcription factor that is specifically expressed in neurons and represses many non-neuronal programs. So the implication is perhaps there is similar uh, repressors out there for other lineages, right? Um, and also, this, if this is true, that would explain that in many reprogramming paradigms, such as our I induced neuronal reprogramming or the IPS reprogramming or hepatocyte reprogramming, it's very often the exact same factors that can reprogram many different lineages. So that makes sense if you think about activating the target program, but how can the same transcription factors silence so many different starting cell uh, programs, right? It would make a lot of sense if there is one of the transcription factors, or maybe more, or a combination of them, that actually repress many non-target programs. And that's, that's how it is that you can actually use the same factors to reprogram so many different cells. 
Yeah, I should point out that Mid One Lake in the last couple of years has been also implicated or, or has been found to be mutated in, in various uh, neurodevelopment, neurodevelopmental diseases. So to be very excited about this. And perhaps these type of mechanisms could explain in those, uh, in those patients that carry these mutations like, uh, uh, why um, uh, uh, these brains get, uh, get sick and, um, and express themselves as they do. All right, with that, I would like to thank uh, all the people in my lab that contributed to this, uh, to this work that I was uh, able to show you here today. Most uh, uh, importantly, uh, Moritz Moll, whom I mentioned already, who did um, all the wet lab experiments uh, related to, um, to mid one like and the bioinformatic analysis was done by Mike Rida, and I mentioned uh, Justi Taipele, a collaboration with the um, Celex experiments, and the many other uh, fabulous colleagues uh, at Stanford and uh, other places that uh, we are happy to collaborate with. Thank you very much for your attention. Uh, okay, so before we start, I need to uh, re uh, remind everybody that uh, my talk was sponsored by Rosalind Cell Sciences. They have a stand just outside the door, so please go and uh, visit there after uh, we're, we're done with the questions. So I noticed that uh, in your uh, picture of people in the lab, you have a very young recruit. Yes. <laughs> For time reasons, I usually point it out, but uh, we do a lot of mini preps in the lab. <laughs> um, <laughs> yes. So we need some help. Yes. <laughs> okay, some questions? Afternoon. Beautiful work. Um, I, I, I'm kind of, that's very interesting. So, in your uh, correlation with the uh, MNAs to see whether there were any nucleosomes there before MIT-1 binding, that was a nice experiment. But uh, what was surprising is you only require two zinc fingers. It's kind of similar to KLF4, which require two zinc fingers, and that's compatible with nucleosomes. Do you think MIT-1 recruit nucleosomes then to the sites that it binds to to close them? After, so w did you look after you induce mid one expression? Very good question. We um, didn't have enough time, unfortunately, to show you. We also did some attack seek experiment, which is another way yeah. of one of the many ways to interrogate uh, nucleosome positioning and, and uh, DNA occupants. Um, and it looks like there's not much change uh, at these mid one like targets, um, which perhaps perhaps makes sense, perhaps not. I don't know, uh, but. Um, it could make sense because mid one leg is obviously bound in fibroblasts as well as in neurons. So in neurons, these genes should be not expressed, right? But still, mid one leg is bound, and it, it's maybe not nucleosomal. In, um, so it's maybe you know, a sort of different mechanism, and mid one leg is repressing. Uh, mid one leg still has to bind, so those specific sites obviously cannot be nucleosomal, right? Otherwise, it couldn't, couldn't bind, I guess, um, if, since it's not a pion effector. Um, so uh, so maybe other mechanisms that sort of silence the, the, the genes rather than just sort of closing down these, these mostly promote elements, right? The, the other question is, uh, I know in, in your first experiment, ACL1 as a pioneer factor was acting differently if you reprogram from fibroblasts rather if you do from keratinocytes. Is MIT1 also a struggle doing the same job from another cell type? Um, we don't know. We have only, uh, we have only done chip seek and fibroblasts. Uh, very, that's a very good question. Yeah, I don't know. We would predict it would be a similar binding pattern, but we, we, we haven't done the experiment. Hmm. Okay, so, um, thank you. That was really fascinating. So um, you showed that one of the things that MIT-1 is doing is strongly repressing the signaling pathways like Wnt and Notch. Yes. So yes. have you asked to what extent you can replace MIT-1 in reprogramming by just inhibiting those pathways? Excellent question. Um, when we block Notch, um, we have almost full, sort of almost full reprogramming activity as, as adding mid one So blocking notch seems to be actually one of the main functions in the reprogramming assay um, to in at least induce the neural <coughs> markers that, that we induced, that, 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 sorry, that we used to measure. But uh, I would maybe uh, assume that things like silencing the fibroblast program may not be as efficient by just blocking notch. But when you look uh, for the positive event, um, Blocking notch seems to be the main, the main role. Mm -hmm. 
miss this because you showed lots of data, but I wanted to ask about reciprocity and reversibility in your system. So in cancer, development, inflammation, mesenchymal epithelial transition is common, so is epithelial mesenchymal transition. So the question really is, can you get a neuron to become a fibroblast? Right. Um, we haven't been able to accomplish this. So I, I don't know. We have tried to analyze very careful the reprogramming process. And we have some hint, uh, based on transcription, uh, that cells might sort of split off halfway and revert back to what they were before. But this is very sort of very loose evidence. So we have no solid evidence for that. Marius, I was wondering, at the end of your talk, you mentioned that uh, like one is basically involved also in neurological diseases. You yep. said that mutations have been yep. found in, in, in families, basically. Yep. Could you explain a little bit what kind of neurological syndromes these sure. are? It is actually, um, so there is this uh, uh, Simons Foundation, uh, which is heavily involved in autism, and they sponsor a lot of uh, sequencing and, and genomics, and they have a uh, sort of... Uh, sort of uh, autism candidate gene lists. Uh, they have, I think, one, the various categories, and uh, I think the top category, which is for sure an autism gene, is only one gene. And then the next category is about 20 genes, but one is one of them. So it's, it's, it seems quite, uh, quite important for uh, autism. But it has been also described in uh, intellectual disabilities and, and sort of various uh, individual families. Uh, with sort of related um, uh, speech delay and these kind of um, um, uh, symptoms. Okay. Uh, Andrew, yeah. Um, you said you haven't done chipsec in any other context, but have you seen if you can reprogram from other cell type, other cell types? Oh, absolutely. Um, yeah. What, what I briefly I mentioned it in, in in the in the sort of uh, last sentences. Yeah, um, so we, we ca so in our for our example um, for uh, inducing neurons, we can reprogram um, a fibroblast, obviously various kinds of fibroblasts, hepatocytes, which we you know have genetically marked, so we, we know there are actually endodermal cells, and more recently also blood cell types, and we always use you know, very similar, if not the same, transcription factors. And when you're alluding to different fibroblast types, those other than embryo. Embryonic, so right. Tails, uh, tail stages, fibroblasts, ages. human fibroblasts of various kinds. Okay. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Okay. Thanks, Thanks very much. Thank Marius. you. Um, so I'd like to uh, thank Marius and the rest of the speakers. Uh,